Welcome, Every Nation Faith City family. My name is Perseverance, and I am going to be your host for the next couple of weeks. Family, we are in for a treat. So grab your friends, grab your family, and that cup of tea. We're headed for the sermon. Enjoy. Good morning, family. I hope you're doing well. My name is Julian. I'm the worship pastor here at Every Nation Faith City, and I'm super excited to be sharing with you guys once again. Today, we're going to be doing a sermon on the land between. We're going to be jumping into a series on Joshua in a couple of weeks. Super excited. If you're watching this a couple of months after I've recorded this, uh, go ahead and check out the Joshua series as well. We're super excited about it. Um, And if it's not released yet, hold on, stay tuned. Uh, You don't want to miss that series. Uh, But today we're going to be talking about the land between. Um, Before we jump in, let's just pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and thank you that your faithfulness is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And regardless of where we find ourselves in the land between, thank you that you are faithful and that you are good and that we can trust you and trust your character. In your name, amen. So, uh, I don't know uh, if any of you guys have been in this situation before, but uh, let me let me just start here and say the following, right? Uh, it's a luxury to be able to tell people what you do because it means you have something to do. You, you have a job of some nature. Uh, a lot of times when you're studying or you're going to university, it's, it's, it's really easy to tell people what you're doing. You're, you just say, well, I'm studying chemo- chemical engineering or I'm studying mathematics or I'm studying theology. Um, and the problem, however, is after you graduate, there is this season, this no man's land, this land between where, uh, you don't really have an answer for what are you doing right now? Uh, it, it might be something like, well, for now I'm working at a coffee shop that I worked at while I was studying. Uh, for now I'm doing an internship for now I'm living with my parents, um, Almost everything you do in that season is prefaced by for now. Now, this isn't just limited to students. Uh, sometimes if, if you're a salesperson, you're stuck in a season where you're like, okay, I've only sold five things this entire year. I've only sold sold five things. Pre-lockdown, I used to sell 10 or 20 or 30, but now I'm just stuck with minimal sales. I'm just stuck in the situation. Uh, you might have an online job and then with load shedding where the power goes out for several hours at a time is happening and now you're like, okay, I don't really know for how long this is going to carry on. Um, not only do you have phrases like for now, you also have phrases like not yet. You have things happening uh, that, that you really want to, you, you don't want to be working with this stuff right now. I'm, I'm working on this stuff for now and I'm not yet able to do what I want to do, what I feel called to do. Sometimes it's getting a phone call in the middle of the night where uh, someone tells you, look, there's been an accident. You need to come to the hospital right now. And it's going to the hospital and visiting a loved one. It's, it's working with them through a physical rehabilitation process. All of a sudden, we find ourselves in the land in between. Now, the land between is about transitions, unexpected or undesirable situations and transitions that we find ourselves in at various points in our lives. Um, The one thing about the land in between is that all of us either were there, are there right now, or one of these days will be there. None of us are immune to seasons of difficulties. A lot of times we feel ourselves like it feels like our work is going nowhere. Uh, it feels like the season that I'm in, I've, I've messed up real bad. And now I have to go through this correctional process. I need to go through this, this season of getting back on my feet. Sometimes I'm fighting PS, PTSD or burnout. And sometimes we wonder, where am I? Not just where I'm going, but like, where am I right now? And the thing is, we're here in the land in between. Uh, 
if there was a physical place where we could have found ourselves in, in the Bible, if we were in a similar spot, it would probably be in the Sinai desert. So the Sinai desert uh, is where the Israelites found themselves after leaving Egypt. They were going to the promised land, but they were in between for 40 years. Now, what do you do when you're in the desert for 40 years? What, what do you, what do you eat? Well, good question, me. Um, <laughs> here is what you eat if you're in the desert for 40 years. First off, you need some form of supernatural provision. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. So the Lord provided this thing called manna. Uh, and the thing about manna, uh, what you read is that it literally it fell from the sky. In the mornings, people would have to go pick up manna. And uh, essentially, you could either eat it like oatmeal, like a mush kind of thing, or you could bake it into cakes. And for several years, they would eat this breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They'd eat manna, 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 breakfast, lunch, and... Are, are you sick of this yet? Because... Here's the thing. We're not nearly as sick of it as they were. The people got sick of eating the same thing over and over and over. So this is what they did is they started complaining. So in Numbers 11, verse 4 to 6, it says uh, the following. It says, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. You remember the garlic. I remember the garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Now, a lot of times we read passages like this and we think, how could they complain? They're literally in the desert. At this point, they've been in the desert for about two years and there's no other source of food. The Lord is literally sending this resource, this food that no one has ever heard of and providing for them on a daily basis. How can they be so ungrateful? But here's the thing is, to some extent, maybe I'm wrong for saying this, but I, I can empathize with them, and I'm sure you can too. Uh, just think about what would happen if you had to eat the same thing every day. Wouldn't you feel the same way? I mean, I think about the following, right? If you're in a season where you've just had to eat the same food over and over, whether it was a financially challenging season or whether it was a season where uh, you were traveling, you were hiking, you're backpacking, and you only have one thing that you packed for the entire trip. I think a lot of people after graduating from university uh, are sick of two-minute noodles, of ramen noodles. And the reason why is because for every day, that was all you could afford slash knew how to cook. So you're sitting and for a year, I remember uh, going on, on, on different breaks or whenever it was, it was holidays and I would stay in the, at my university and the cafeteria would be closed. I would eat ramen noodles, two minute noodles, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was about two years after I graduated before I, I, I wasn't sickened by the very sound of the, of the crinkling packet of two minute noodles being opened. And it was, that was just... That was just after having dealt with this for about a week, a year. They had to deal with this for two or three years. A lot of times we think, oh, I'd never do anything like that. But here's the thing uh, that, that that came from this. is uh, A lot of times we go through seasons where we sit and we think, I'm sick of this. I'm so sick of that. I'm sick of not getting paid enough. I'm sick of this load shedding. I'm sick of giving this person a second chance. I'm sick of forgiving them, turning the other cheek, and then they do the same thing again. I'm sick of hearing about fuel prices going up again. Now, a lot of times we think that nothing grows in the desert, but I want to tell you guys something today. The desert is fertile ground. It's fertile ground for a few things, but the first thing that it's fertile ground for is complaining. So a lot of times we go through a shortage and it's very easy to complain. It's easy to complain, to miss the miracle, to miss the provision and complain. 
Now, what's Moses during? What is Moses doing during this time? Well, he's the leader. He should be fine. A lot of us are thinking, but but how is he handling this? How is this strong leader doing? He is like their rock, after all. You know, the, the, the thing that's holding them together. But what we read in verse eleven is that this rock is about to crack. This is the most honest prayer, in my opinion, one of the most honest prayers in the Bible that we see recorded. And as we read this passage, I want us to, to pay attention to all the, the, the me pronouns, the I, the me, and uh, see what's happening. So I'm going to give you guys a clue. Moses is having a meltdown. And uh, it starts from Numbers 11, verse 11. He says, uh, he asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? I am not their mom. Um, <laughs> that's just me adding that. Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. So Moses has a meltdown. Now, not only is the land in between fertile for complaining, it's fertile for emotional meltdown. If that phrase meltdown, by the way, seems too harsh, let's read what Moses says in verse 15. He says, if this is how you are going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, kill me <laughs> and do not let me face my own ruin. Basically, what Moses is saying is, please kill me right there. And then I think a lot of times we have these really, really bad days where we're just up to here with everything around us. And we can't help but go, this is too heavy. I can't do this anymore. If this is ministry, Lord, if this is leadership, if you love me, kill me now. Now, there is a place in the land in between where we can take our problems, our exhaustion, our burnout before God. There's actually a similar story before I continue with this one, where Elijah, the prophet Elijah, has this meltdown moment. And what happens is, so in, in 1 Kings 19, uh, from verse 4, it says the following, it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Now this is what happens. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. So in the middle of his burnout, the Lord wakes him up and gives him food. I think sometimes we expect God to give us a lecture, but instead he gives us a lunch. And something that I love about this is God gave him hot bread, not stale bread. He gave him something comforting. And I think a lot of times when we're in these seasons, when we go, God, I can't take this anymore. It's too much for me. Like in the case of Moses. So back to the thing about Moses. I don't know about you, but I'm hearing other voices. I'm not just hearing Moses' voice. I hear the voices of people losing their businesses, their family members, their marriages. People who are experiencing meltdown in the land in between. Now, it's really important to think then, okay, but how does God answer Moses? Moses is burnt out. How does God respond? What does God do when I'm burnt out? What does he do when I'm in the land in between? I think there's a clue to that that we can see in Numbers 11, verse 16. Here's, what, here's how God answers Moses during his meltdown. He says, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting, that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden with you so that you don't have to carry this alone. I think some of the, the, the first ways that God brings help in our time of need is by putting people around us. 
the enemy wants to isolate us. And a lot of times we want to isolate ourselves or we feel like, you know, there's no one around me. Elijah actually in that passage, he goes, Lord, there's no one around you who eat like around me who even serves you. And God says, that's not true. There's over 400 believers who have not bowed the knee. I think a lot of times we try and convince ourselves or the enemy convinces us that we are alone, but that's not true. We're not alone. And if you feel alone right now and you feel like, you know what, I don't have community, I want you to reach out in the comments. Like reach out to us. We'd love to be there for you. Don't isolate yourself in this time. The thing that we see in this is you see that God <laughs> takes this, his spirit that was on Moses and he dumps the spirit on the 70 people around him. He lightens the burden. The next thing we see in the land between is not only is it a place for uh, for complaining or a place for burnout or meltdown, it is a place, it is fertile ground for God's provision. God provides in the middle of this situation. Now, we've kind of dealt with half of Moses' problem, the, the, the food thing. The other half we have to talk about, though, is the complaining people. What does God do with a mob of angry ex-slaves that are at the point of riot due to frustration? This is what God does. He says, tell the people, this is in verse 18, tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will eat it. You will not just eat it for just one day or two days or five days, 10 or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Now, this is what happens next. So then Moses responded back to the Lord. But Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot. And you say, I'll give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough of all the fish in the sea were caught for them? So what's happening is Moses is going, okay, this, this sounds great and amazing. But how are you going to feed like is there an ocean we don't know about here in the desert? Like, I, I can't, like, even fathom. I can't even fathom you providing for, like, a day, but for a whole month. Now, the Lord answers Moses like this, and he says, The Lord answered Moses, Is the arm, is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. So sometimes we question and this is what God is addressing, and this is what we see him upset with in this season, is you see that he's, he's upset that they are questioning whether he is capable enough or compassionate enough to be there for them or provide for them. Is the arm of the Lord too short? If we only hear one thing today, it's this question, and it's this thing. Is God's arm too short to save you where you're at? Is he not compassionate enough? Is he not capable enough? And I want to tell you that he is compassionate enough. He is capable enough. So what it says is that no one collected less than 10 omers. So that's the equivalent of a pickup truck, a Bucky's load worth of quail a day. That's each person. So the Lord provided an abundance of quail, more than anyone could conceive. But not only did he provide the meat that they sought, Scripture goes on, and this, this is the scary part, right? To say that he also sent a plague throughout Israel, and people died in those days. People died. So this, this actually gives us two opportunities to talk about. So number one, it gives us the opportunity to talk about the uncomfortable truth of God's discipline. And it's also a great story to tell someone who's complaining about food, um, especially children who don't want to eat their vegetables. Remember, kids. <laughs> Remember, kids. Let's go to the Bible real quick and just look at the following story and just see. This is what happened. People complained about their food. Eat your food. <laughs> Anyway, seriously though, uh, God is showing his hand of discipline by inflicting pain for redemptive purposes. 
So God is sh- trying to show them something. God is trying to teach them uh, what lies ahead in his plans for them. He's trying to get their attention before the incident goes bad. So let me let me explain what I mean by this. The land between isn't just fertile ground for all the things we mentioned before. It's fertile ground for growth, for transformational growth and discipline. When we end up in transitions that we really hate, maybe God is attempting to grow trust in us. Because here's what's happening is when you look at the scripture above that we just went through when the Lord said he'll provide, the big issue that he had is that they didn't trust him. They wanted to go back not just to the land, but to the old gods. They forgot that they were holding on to God's promises. So these unruly ex-slaves were brought up in the doctrines of evil, Egyptian idolatry, and they were not ready to represent the invisible God of the universe, which was why they were in the desert. Here's the thing that God keeps asking his people is, will you trust me? Will you trust me? When you're under attack, will you trust me? When you run out of food and water, will you trust me? God doesn't want us running to idols when we're in a crisis. He didn't want them running into idols, running to idols when they get to the promised land. What we learn in the land in between actually is faith and trust. The desert is a greenhouse for trust to grow, but the land between Though it is a place of growth, it can also be a place where faith goes to die. I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, probably have, time heals all wounds. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's true. And the reason why is how many of you guys have ever seen someone go through a really hard time and then 10, 20, 30 years later, they're still complaining about it. What happens is time gives you an opportunity to grow. But here's the thing is there are many people who just grow more bitter and more angry and more poisonous in their attitudes. I want to ask us today, when we are hurt, where do our hearts go? Do we come to the Lord in prayer or do we resent him for the season that we were in or the season that we're in? Now, the only way to clean complaint out of our lives is to trust. We've heard that a good movement pushes out bad movement and bad movement pushes out good movement. Well, to trust is telling God, I hate this place. I don't like what I'm going through, but I will trust you, God, while I'm in this space. Trust overcomes complaint. So God wanted them to trust him. Will you trust me? We learn faith and trust in the land between. Time doesn't heal, trust heals. So imagine the following, you come home And you notice that there is a visitor sitting on your couch and his name is Complaint. And Complaint has already unpacked his suitcase. He's doing a load of laundry and he's, he he then ruffles through your fridge, rummages through your fridge and he's, he, he lives there now. Now here's the thing is you can't have him living there if you want trust to live there. You need to kick him out. Trust and Complaint are incompatible roommates. In order for us to trust, We need to kick out complaint. If we are in the land in between, I just want to say this uh, just as we land. If we're in the land in between, we need to be aware that the ground is fertile. It's fertile for complaining, for meltdown, for God's provision, for his discipline, and for his supernatural transformation. But most of all, we have to choose which roommate we let in. Trust your complaint. We need to trust him daily, even when we're in the land between, and even if we're not. Jesus taught his disciples to pray for daily bread, daily provision. Lord, I need your comfort today. Because here's the amazing truth, and this is what I want to end on, is we can experience a season of shortage and a season of joy at the same time. Let me just pray for us. Lord, I just want to pray for us right now, and I just want to pray for all our friends who are watching today. Whether they are in the land in between, they're coming out of that season, or just entering in it, whether they are burnt out or regardless of what they're going through, Lord, I just pray right now that you help us to trust you in this season. Lord, thank you that you are good and that you are faithful and that we can trust you regardless of what we're going through. Whether it's trusting you for a new job or whether it's trusting you for the strength to apply for a few more jobs. 
thank you that you are faithful and that the land between is not our destination. But you don't want us entering the promised land in a spirit of complaint. You want us to enter it with a spirit of trust. Thank you that you are preparing us for the next season. In Jesus' name, amen. That was such a good word. Family, I am pretty sure your notebook is a bit few pages fuller. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for faithfully partnering with this ministry. We are able to reach people from different nations, and that is because of your partnership. So I want to take a moment to say, hey, there's another way that you can partner with us, and that is to follow us on our social media and sharing this word that will encourage a friend and a family in any time and space that they are in. So you can also get in contact with us on our platforms as well as on our website. So check it out. We want to hear your story, your testimonies, and we want to get to know you. So contact us and we're looking forward to getting to know you better. Family, that is all from my side. I cannot wait to see you next time. So see you soon. <laughs>